In the first part of this lecture, we discussed the concept of the phaser, and we agreed that the phaser represents the amplitude and the phase information about the sinusoidal signal. It's a complex number. It's a complex number. And if you want to take it back to the time domain, you multiply by e to the j omega t, and then you take the real part, and this will give you the cosine, cosine omega t plus the angle multiplied by the amplitude. Now, we'd like to know what will happen if I differentiate a signal. So here, for example, we have a signal x of t, and we have a signal y of t. y of t is the derivative of x of t, so it's dx by dt. And y is simply obtained from its phasor through this expression that we agreed on before. You multiply the phasor by e to the g omega t, and then you take the real part. And here I'm assuming that y contains the amplitude here is, the, is not to the RMS, it's the actual maximum value. It does not really make a difference except, as I, as I mentioned earlier, for a scaling factor of square root of 2. Now, my, my, question, my target here is to determine what will be the phasor of y in terms of the phase of x, if x, if y is the derivative of x in time. And this is how we start, we start by this expression. This is here is x of t. x of t is nothing but the real part of e to the g omega t multiplied by the phase of x. So, and y of t is simply the derivative of this quantity. The real part and the time derivative are exchangeable, so I can move d by dt to the inside, and then whatever will come out from here, I will take the real part of it. So I first apply the derivative, and then I take the real part of the quantity. Now, this is the derivative of x multiplied by e to the g omega t. x here is a complex number. It's not a function of time. So this is the only thing that's a function of time. The derivative of e to the g omega t relative to t is simply equal to g omega multiplied by e to the g omega t. So we end up with this term. Now take a look at this term. y of t, which is here, is equal to the real part of this quantity. This quantity is equal to g omega x multiplied by e to the g omega t. But y of t is also equal to real of the phase of y multiplied by e to the g omega t. If you compare this part and this part, you will conclude that g omega x, the g omega multiplied by the phase of x is simply the phase of y. So in other words, if, if y of t is the derivative of x of t in time, then the phase of y is equal to the phase of x multiplied by g omega. So differentiation in time results in multiplying by g omega in the frequency domain. Remember, this is a complex number. You multiply by g omega. This is another complex number. Then you get a complex number. Then y is also a complex number. The same derivation can be obtained from uh, the, the integral. What will happen to the, to the, to the phasor of uh, y, of, y of t if y of t is the integral of x of t? This is our target here. How can I de deduce the phasor of y from the phasor of x? y of t is simply the real part of the phasor of y multiplied by e to the g omega t. This is known. We start first by the x and then we expand, we write x as real part of e to g omega t x. And then we apply the same mathematical trick. We know that the real part and the integration are, 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 uh, are uh, what, what's the word here? They are um, commutative. So I can apply one before the other. So I can move the, do the integration first and then I apply the real part later. So I'm gonna integrate, integrate this quantity relative to, to t. But x is simply a complex number. It's not a function of t. I can take it out from the integral. The integral of e to the g omega t relative to t, you divide by g omega here. Now, if you compare this expression with this expression, this is y of t and this is y of t, you will conclude that the phase of y is the phase of x divided by g, g omega. And this is also another fundamental property of phasors. If y of t is the integral of x of t in time, then the phase of y is the phase of x divided by g omega. Why is this important? Because we know from uh, this discussion about inductors and the capacitors, you know the inductors, for example, that V is equal to L di by dt. Then the phase of the voltage of the inductor is equal to L multiplied by the j omega, the phase of the current. We know from the capacitors that I is equal to C dv by dt. Then the phasor, then we can see that the phasor of the current in the capacitor 
is equal to C multiplied by G omega multiplied by the phase of the voltage. So by doing that, we can obtain equivalent impedances for inductors and capacitors. So now we start with the inductor. Inductor, we know that it's, it's, it's governed by the equation V is equal to L di by dt. This is the relationship between V and I in the time domain. But in the frequency domain, this means that the phase of V is equal to the L multiplied by G omega, the phase of I. Remember, when you differentiate it to T, you multiply the phase by G omega. So this means that the phase of V is equal to the phase of I multiplied by G omega L. This term here is what we call the impedance of the inductor. It, re it really it has the same expression as the resistance. So V is equal to I R, but it's not really R. It's an impedance, it's a complex number. It represents, it represents resistance to the current, but also a phase shift. The phase shift here is J. And if you know from complex analysis, J is simply equal to the E to the J by over 2. So it's a phase shift of by over 2. And this is why in this case we say that the voltage leads the current by an angle of by over 2. In the case for the inductor. So when I, if I ask you for the impedance of the, of the inductor in any, in any AC circuit, you should always remember the impedance is J omega L. Omega is the radian, is the angular frequency in radian per second. L is the inductance in Henry's. When you multiply this one, you get impedance in ohm. And it is a complex number. The phase of the current is a complex number. The phase of the voltage is a complex number. The same thing applies for admittance. I know for, for the inductor as well that I is 1 over L the integral of V dt. So this is saying that the phase of I is equal to 1 over L, the phase of V divided by G omega. Remember, integrating in time means that you divide the phase by G omega. Now, this means that I is equal to V over G omega L. We call this term that multiplies V the admittance. Admittance. Admittance is the inverse of the impedance. So the impedance G omega L, the admittance is 1 over G omega L. The impedance relates the voltage to the current. The admittance relates the current to the voltage. So, so this is now how we're going to be analyzing inductors from now on. If I ask you to do an AC analysis, you have to replace every inductor by an impedance of value J omega L or an admittance of 1 over J omega L. The same thing applies for capacitance as well. We know from, from capacitance that I is equal to C dV by dt. This is in time, as signals in time. But when I take it to the frequency domain, when I take it to the phasor domain, the derivative with respect to t means differentiating, the, the, multiplying the phasor by j omega. So this means this one, if you convert to the phasor domain, this is j omega v and this i. So this is simply saying that i is equal to j omega c multiplied by v. This term here is, the, is an admittance because it relates the current is equal to voltage multiplied by the admittance. So we know that the admittance of a capacitor is equal to J omega C. And if you do the other way around, you start by from the expression of the voltage, that the voltage is 1 over C, the integral of the current. You can take this expression to the frequency domain or the phasor domain. We use both terms in an equivalent way. This will give you, this is, this will give you the phasor of I divided by J omega. And then you divide by C. So this is telling you that the voltage across the capacitor, the phasor voltage across the capacitor, is equal to the current phasor multiplied by this impedance term. This impedance term has units of ohm, and it's 1 over J omega C. This is the impedance of the capacitor. Now you should remember, when you divide by J omega, this is equivalent to minus J over omega C. And minus j in the frequency domain is e to the minus j by over 2. e to the minus j by over 2 will be equal sine by over 2, which is 0, minus j sine by over 2, which is, will give you minus j. So this means that the car, that here for, for, for the capacitor, the voltage is lagging behind the, the, the current because you subtracted by over 2 from the phase. So now we have three components that we discussed so far in terms of phasors. We have a resistor in the time domain. As the current increase, increase the voltage will increase as well. They are in phase. If the current decreases, the voltage will decrease as well. V is equal to IR. R is a resistor 
there is no phase shift between them. In the phasor domain, they represent both of them sinusoidal signals pointing along the same line. They are pointing along the same line because they have the same phase. If one of them shifts to, uh, to the right by an angle of theta, the other one will shift by an angle of theta as well. So they are both in the same phase. This is why they, they look like that in the phasor domain. Why for an inductor? We agree that inductor V is equal to L di by dt. So the voltage is the derivative of the current. So if you have the current here, this is minus cosine, then the, the, voltage, the voltage will be a sine. You see here that the voltage is leading the, the current. How can I know that? This is the start of the waveform of the current. Okay, it starts at time A. While here, the voltage starts at time zero. So this means that the voltage is leading the current. It starts earlier than the current. Okay, so this is why the, 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 when you draw them as phasors, we can draw the angle, of course, each one of them has a magnitude and a phase. If this is a magnitude and phase for the current, this will be the magnitude and the phase of the voltage. And you can see the angle between them is pi over 2, because the voltage leads the current by pi by, by over 2. This is how we represent this in the phasor domain. Uh, so just remember, for an inductor, the voltage leads the current. It leads it by an angle of pi over 2, because if the current is minus cosine, the voltage is equal to a sign. The opposite happens for the case of the capacitor. Here we have the current of the capacitor, it's a cosine. We know that the uh, I is equal to C dV by dt. I is equal to C dV by dt. So if the, if the voltage is a sign, the current is a cosine. Okay? But here if you have a cosine signal, and if you try just to complete the cycle here, this is where the cosine really starts. This is the same this is the start of the sign. This is the same phase point here when it starts from zero. So you can see here that the current is leading. This is the, this is the current. The current is leading the voltage. The voltage starts from at time zero while the current starts at time minus pi over two. So the current here leads the voltage. And when you draw them in the, in the phasor domain, you can, of course, each one of them is a complex number. It has a magnitude, it has a phase. This will be the voltage and this will be the current. So you see that the current is leading, is leading the voltage by pi over 2. This is how we draw them in the frequency domain. I'm not going to be put big weight on the phasor domain. I just want you to understand what do, I, what do I mean when I say that the current in the capacitor leads the voltage in the capacitor, or that the voltage in the inductor leads the current of the inductor. It is simply because one of them is the derivative of the other. And in phasor domain, this means a phase shift of pi over 2. Now, let's consider an example. We have here a circuit. It consists of a 4 ohm resistor in series with 7.96 millihenry inductor. They are both connected to 100 volts um, uh, uh, voltage source and 60 hertz. Okay? And when you say 100 volts like that, it's, we indicate that this is the RMS value. Our target is to determine the input impedance seen from the voltage from the voltage source side, determine the current I flowing in these two, and determine the voltages VR and VL. And here, these are all required as phasors, okay? Uh, because I have here one frequency, it's 60 hertz, so all the voltages and currents will all also be sinusoidal signals with frequency 60 hertz. So we only care about their phasor, their amplitude and their phase. So now let's see how we can proceed. Of course, we have to determine omega from the 60 hertz. Omega is 2 by F. And then we can determine this is the impedance of the resistors for ohm. We have to determine the impedance of the inductor. It is equal to J omega L. So we have to determine that. And then the arbosin series. Then we can get the current I. The current I is equal to the phasor of the voltage divided by R plus J omega L. And once we have I, I can get the current in the resistor as R multiplied by I. I can get the current, the, sorry, I can get the voltage across the resistor, which is R multiplied by I. I can get the voltage across the inductor, which is I multiplied by J omega L, by this impedance here. So, as I explained earlier, we start first by calculating the impedance of the inductor. 
the impedance of the inductor, as long as we have one frequency, it is simply equal to j omega L. j is the square root of minus 1. It's simply to indicate the complex number. Omega is 2 by f. Our frequency here is 60 hertz. The inductance is 7.96 millihenry. When you multiply all these, the numbers simplify and they give you j3 ohm. So the impedance of the inductor has, uh, has a modulus of 3, but it creates a phase shift between the voltage and current of 90 degrees. This is what this means. J3 means it resists the voltage, it represents an in and resistance to the voltage of 3 ohm, but it also act it creates a phase difference between the voltage and the current of 90 degrees. Now, the total input impedance seen by the source is R plus J plus ZL. R is 4, Z ZL, the, in the impedance of the inductor is J3, so it's 4 plus J3. Now, what is the current? The current, you divide these two complex numbers, the phasor of the voltage and then the phasor of the, um, the, phasor of the impedance. So this is 110 angle 0 and this is RMS, you divide it by 4 plus J3. And 4 plus J3, you can convert it to its polar form. The polar form of a complex number is simply the square root of the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. So if you take the real bar squared, so it's square root of 16 plus 9 will give you 5. The angle is the inverse tangent of the imaginary bar over the real bar. So inverse tangent of 3 over 4, and this will give you 36.87 degrees. So now, divide, now how we divide the two complex numbers? The, real, the, the magnitude by the magnitudes, 110 by 5 will give you 22. And then you subtract the angle of the numerator. You subtract from that the angle of the denominator. So this will become 0 minus 36. So it's going to give you minus 36.87. So this is the current and this is the phase of the current. This has only information about the amplitude and the phase. If you want to convert it to time domain, you have to multiply by e to the g omega t and then take the real part. Now that we have the current, we can get the voltage drop across the resistor. We can get the voltage drop across the inductor. The voltage drop across the resistor is simply equal to IR, very simple. We already determined what is I, it is this phasor, uh, 22, the RMS value, angle of minus 36.87. The resistor is 4, 4 here is 4, angle 0. When you multiply two complex number, 4 will multiply 22. The angle here, which is 0, will add to minus 36, so it remains minus 36. Now, the, the voltage across the inductor is I multiplied by ZL. I is, for I is equal to uh, the one we calculated earlier, is the same. ZL, remember, was J3. And I explained to you earlier that J is nothing but an angle of 90 degrees. And where did, the, did this come from? Because J is equal to E to the J by over 2. This is one of the properties of complex numbers. So this J3, I can write it at 3 angle 90. So now when you multiply two complex numbers, the, the magnitude multiply the magnitude. So 3 multiplies 22, you get 66. And the angles add, so 90 add to minus 36, you get 53. So this is the voltage across the inductor as a phasor. If you want to convert it to the time domain, you have to multiply by e to the g omega t, where omega is 2 by multiplied by 60, and then you take the real part. And then you can determine how this, gonna be, how this will look like in the frequency domain, uh, in the time domain as a, as a cosine signal. 